Hey guys, Rafi here from the End Game Investor, and today we're going to talk about how long the fuse might be until the End Game finally arrives. And I have a precise answer to this question. Do I know for sure if it's the right precise answer? No, but I will show you why the right answer, whatever it may be, is going to be close to that figure. We're going to talk about spreading hyperinflation throughout the world. Now, Norway is the newest victim of hyperinflation. Eventually, it will free the monetary system of the entire world. It is a cure that is painful, but it is a cure that is needed. And we'll also talk about how on the Fed, Uber hawks are becoming Uber doves, and Uber doves are becoming Uber hawks, which proves beyond a reasonable doubt that nobody on the Fed stands for a damn thing. Let's go to the charts. First thing I want to share is a very long-term chart. This is a yearly candle chart, meaning each candle is one year, starting from the bond bull market beginning of 1981. Here you have a trend line developing in around 1985. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. When the seesaw of the bond bear bull market, bear market, back and forth, finally got a bit more stable around that year. And from there, we saw a consistent downtrend in 10-year rates. 10-year yields are widely considered to be the most important yield in the market because it is the benchmark by which all businesses set their interest rates once this bull market breaks and it looks like it already has then the interest rate regime over the entire planet is going to shift and very rapidly we tested this trend line many times along this bond bull market where yields kept falling consistently. The first time we broke through that trading rate is just barely, you see here in this little circle, that year is 2007 on the eve of the 2008 financial crisis. You see, according to Austrian business cycle theory, you don't just need low rates to sustain and perpetuate a boom. You need consistently lower rates, which means the equivalent of a junkie. Patterns in nature repeat themselves and reflect themselves, just like a junkie needs higher and higher doses of meth or heroin or wherever he gets high, they need to consistently increase, meaning you need constantly lower and lower interest rates. You can't just have a constant low interest rate that will not stimulate artificial growth or artificial pleasure. And why do you need consistently lower and lower interest rates? This isn't just a theory that we work out on some physics paper. It makes rational sense because in order to sustain the illusion of growth, if you are going into debt to buy a bunch of stuff, if you are going into debt to accumulate assets, you have all that debt to service. In order to service it while sustaining the illusion of growth, it means to buy more assets and to look even richer when you are actually poorer, you need lower and lower and lower interest rates in order to service that higher and higher and higher debt to sustain the illusion that you have a bunch of stuff that you actually own when you do not. So you need constantly lower and lower interest rates. And what is the final limit of that? Reality. When you can no longer sustain your debt service and you lose everything that you have accumulated throughout that debt boom. There is nothing complicated about this. It's all very basic things that people experience in their normal lives. It's the macro economists that screw things up in our heads. So anyway, we see in 2007, we broke through this trading range barely, and then bam, we have a financial crisis, which is why this red bar is here as the Fed buys bonds and pushes the interest rate down further because it needs to in order to stimulate the economy to keep this bubble going. And by this bubble, I mean this entire thing, all the way from 1980 until now. The next time that this trend was broken was 2018, 2019. You see, we're trading above range here. And here we have the 2018, I think it was the Boxing Day crash. And this was when the Fed was last reducing their balance sheet and trying to get back to 
what they would call normalcy in terms of interest rates. They didn't even get close. They didn't even barely start. And they pushed down below that trend line in 2020 with the biggest money printing operation in human history. And now, 2021, we, we eh, barely broke that trend line and now we are way above it. This is where we are now. For the first time, we have decisively broken through this trend line, and that is a very dangerous thing for anyone who relies on the bubble to sustain their lives on Earth, which is, unfortunately, most people. Now, as for the length of the fuse, here, these are the interest rate highs on the 10-year for October 2018, which came in at this number right here, 3.248. We are right now at 2.75. This is the chart ending on Friday, last weekend, April 8th, I believe. It is now April 11th, April 9th, April 11th, whatever. You get the point. We are now at 2.75. So the fuse at 3.24 is about 50 basis points away, just under 50 basis points. And once you have that, then you have a danger of the big bondholders internationally starting to dump their paper because they're experiencing paper losses that they do not want to sustain, especially if their economies are themselves hyperinflating. The fuse on this bomb, I believe, is about 50 basis points long. What happens then? What I think happens is that one of these days, possibly just beyond 3.25 on the 10 year, maybe 3.3, maybe 3.4, it's somewhere in that range, exactly where I cannot tell you, but it is close to that. At some point, we are going to see a weekend where some country or other that is experiencing high price inflation in its economy for its people is going to massively sell. And there's going to be a big gap up in interest rates, possibly from let's say 3.3 to 4% over a weekend and people are going to freak out. By people, I mean international bond holders like foreign central banks. I don't just mean bond traders and BlackRock or whatever. I mean central banks, other money printers that are in this game. And now I wanna go a little bit into the Bullard and the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. We tend to have this fantasy that there are some hawks on the Fed versus some doves. Well, the truth is there are no hawks, there are no doves. There are simply people who are trying to keep their jobs and they all come together and balance their rhetoric to make it look like there is a balanced intellectual discussion of what to do next. When the truth is none of them have any clue what they are doing. There is a camp in the gold bugs and these silverbacks that seem to think that the Fed has this grandiose plan, that they are geniuses, and that they have this reset plan where they're going to enslave us for all eternity. Well, I can respond to that with just a very simple answer. Slavery cannot, can never be permanent, and nobody can perpetuate evil forever. And those that think they can are stupid. So let's go into the example of Bullard, who is considered the Fed uber hawk, quote unquote, versus Lael Brainerd, who is considered the Fed uber dove, quote unquote. They have reversed roles, sort of like a dominant submissive switch. Let's go into what I mean. This is a presentation that Fed so-called uber hawk, James Bullard, gave at some university in, the, in St. Louis or Missouri or something. And the truth is, I could look it up and sound smart as if I know exactly what university he gave it in, but the truth is, I don't care. He says, Bullard, and if you listen to this guy, he has no tone in his voice, and his intonations sound quite soulless. Bullard is the guy that descended from the Fed's last rate hike of 25 basis points because he believed it should be 50 basis points, which encapsulates him as the Fed's uber hawk, quote unquote. But here he is making an argument that the Fed is not behind the curve. What does he say? Because the economy is doing great. And I will smash that assumption with one slide. 
Here he says, real GDP growth and labor markets are robust. The second bullet point here that begins labor markets. Labor markets are robust and are likely to improve further in 2022. That's so nice, James. The U.S. unemployment rate has fallen to 3.6% and will likely fall below 3% later this year. Great. An event that has not occurred since the 1950s. Wow. 70 years economic boom. We're all in heaven. Let's all celebrate. This would make the U.S. labor market one of the best in the entire post-World War II era. And therefore, Bullard argues that the Fed is not behind the curve. There is no need to seriously worry about inflation because the economy is doing just fine. Yes, we need rate hikes, but we need to calm down, says Bullard. Uberhawk. What is my response to that? Simply this slide. Employment in Weimar, Germany throughout the 1920s. Here, the first line is 1920. We have what looks to be about 4%. These tick marks are 2% each. 1921, inflation is what? 20% annual. 1922, the year before the ultimate hyperinflation, is the lowest unemployment in Germany from 1920 to 1936. Isn't the economy in Weimar great, especially during this hyperinflation? The answer is... No, because people earn a lot of nominal money, but they can't eat, which is exactly what is happening now. From there, let's move to the hyperinflationary countries of the world, which are expanding. These numbers just came out from Norway. I will quote trading economics here. It says producer prices in Norway rose at a record pace of 79.4% year on year in March, 2022. What do you think happens when prices, producer prices, the cost of producing stuff that people consume rises 80% year on year? Does this smell like hyperinflation? It's more than a smell, it's a stench. And so we have a 50 basis point bomb fuse lit. And at the point when 10-year rates cross 3.248 or somewhere around there, it doesn't have to be exactly that number, you're going to start to see central bank, the central bank cabal, start to fight itself and break up into currency blocks. You're going to see interest rates rise in real terms, and you're going to see a return to gold and silver and a dump of all financial assets, including, unfortunately, for the Bitcoin people, Bitcoin. This is Rafi, the Endgame Investor. If you enjoyed this video, consider signing up for a two-week free trial of the Endgame Investor. We only have a few months left until the Endgame hits, at which point I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I might not need to do much, but I will continue with my biblical commentary from an economic standpoint, and you can find that as my patron on Patreon. Link in the description below. Have a good week. Have a good month. Have a good year, or however much time we have left until the regime finally changes. Well, then I guess there's only one thing left to do. What's that? Win the whole fucking thing.